Miami's 2022 preseason games are officially underway, and a surprise international one that will give us a glimpse of what to expect from this retooled roster is on the cards. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Miami Total Football Radio, also known in English as Miami Total Football Radio, the number one and most listened to podcast on Inter Miami, a podcast that has been heard in more than 50 countries and we continue to grow that number continues to grow so thank you for listening as always my name is franco panizo if you're new here my two co-hosts to my right and left not really because we're doing this virtually but my two co-hosts are steve el primo brenner and jose cinco armando i didn't forget the nickname jose it's cinco now you are officially cinco no longer ps5 jose so if anybody missed last week's show you are now cinco it's your new nickname jose how are you doing today I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Excited. You know, we get um, uh, two matches this week. Well, you know, it's been a while since we've seen Inter Miami play. So, you know, it it doesn't get any better than that. We will get our first glimpse at what this team has to offer. We're going to touch on that, what we expect, not only from these two games, but especially the one on Wednesday, because it will be against a team from Peru, a friendly that was put together pretty last minute and announced pretty late. But that should be interesting because it's an international opponent. So we'll see how this new, younger Inter-Miami squad fares up early on in preseason against that level of an opponent. Steve, primo, how are you doing today on this fine Tuesday afternoon? Good, man. I'm good, thank you. Um, braving the, the cold, the Arctic weathers of uh, <laughs> flooded South Florida, going to, doing the school run in my hat, woolly hat. It's just like being back in back in the UK. But um, yeah, as, as, as I said, looking forward to... Uh, Seeing, seeing how the new, um, the new, new purchases sort of meld, meld in, into the squad, and um, I hope we're going to touch later on when we saw Breck Shea handle a snake at the training ground. We will definitely touch on Breck Shea roping up a snake out of the bushes and trying to get it off the pitch. Snakes on a pitch, as I saw someone uh, cleverly post somewhere on the on the World Wide Web. We'll touch on that. We will touch on again this Wednesday's friendly against Universitario de Deportes. We will also touch on. This most recent friendly that was played behind closed doors against the Columbus crew. We have exclusive details that have not been put out there yet. So we will share those with you on this pod. And we will, of course, answer some questions at the very end. But but we have a very special surprise for you guys. In the form, we'll give you a hint of an interview with a protagonist on Inter-Miami. One of the players on Inter-Miami will come on here and be our very first guest of 2022. We said we had some treats for you. This is one of them. And it will be a fun, insightful interview that you will hear. So stay tuned for that. That will come a little later on. But there's a lot to talk about, a lot to get into. So let's get to it. Okay, guys. So late last week, Inter Miami officially announced that the team would be hosting Universitario de Deportes, one of the Peruvian powerhouses, the historical Peruvian powerhouses, in a friendly at Drive Pink Stadium on Wednesday night. And tickets are being sold. Fans can attend this game. Again, it will be the first chance that we get to see this team up close and personal, see what's changed, see what they're working on stylistically from a tactical standpoint, etc., etc., but this caught me by surprise a little bit. I know reports started coming out during the midweek. I had some some people starting reaching out to me about, about the game being a possibility. And then it was announced on Friday and again for this Wednesday. So a very quick turnaround from the announcement to the game. A match that's added to the preseason schedule. But, Jose, what do you think we can expect from this game? Because Inter Miami is in the second week of preseason. They're probably still working on fitness to an extent. They're obviously clearly still going to be working on relationships on the field and tactical understanding of what Phil Neville wants. But what can we expect or what do you think we can expect on Wednesday night at Dry Pink Stadium? Well, I, I, you know, I think first off, I think it's an opportunity for, for the players to get on the field. You know, they did play a friendly against Columbus crew over the weekend, but it's not the same when you play close door. This is the opportunity for the players, for the new players to connect with, uh, with, with the fan base. Um, I I don't know. I, I I think this is a little bit of a risky move, and and I will tell you why. Because um, 
if Universitario is in better shape than Inter Miami, playing at the international level, you don't know what to expect. You don't know the team you're facing. Um, I think it's too early. I think it's too early. Hopefully everything goes well for Inter Miami. But, you know, if, if, Inter, Miami, if Inter Miami is still is not in that place where, you know, players have gel, they know each other, what they want to do, they know the system, which it's, it's fairly early. So it wouldn't be surprising if they have some miscommunication on the field. So in that sense, I think it's a little bit risky. But, you know, it talks a little bit about the confidence as well that this team has on, on this group of players that they will be able to compete at the international level. I know it's a friendly. I know it's a friendly. But the one thing that you don't want to see from Inter Miami is a bad performance because that's what uh, fans have, have been going to Drive Pink Stadium for the last few years. They, they have seen bad performances. So you want to stay away from that. You want, you, you want to start with, uh, with a good performance against the team. It doesn't really matter the result. But it does matter that the team plays with a little bit more intensity, attacking minded, and you know things that the fans wants to want to see from this team. Steve, what do you think we will see on Wednesday night? What do you think Phil Neville will look to get out of Wednesday's game? Is it just some fitness? Is it some tactical work? What What do you expect Inter Miami to work on or try to really? hone in there on this game because again this game came came together pretty late on i had heard that you know the deal wasn't even done till late in the week prior to just inter miami announcing it so what do you think that inter miami will look to gain or get out of this game bit of everything you know pre it's pre-season so as Jose said it's fitness it's tactics they're looking at different shapes you know they've had a whole raft of players come in they want to try and look at different systems different formations how they're kind of interacting you know go back you know, this time last year, that the whole thing was all the matches were getting postponed because of COVID. Remember, they went to um, they went to Sarasota. Although two or three of those games were called off. It's preseason. It's the first run out. You know, and you can play as much as you want intra squad games and the training. You know, at that in you know the Dry Pink Stadium or whatever. But you cannot, and it's a cliche, you cannot beat proper match action and um yeah and that that is merely it look i don't think it's, it's not a risk i mean it's just them going through their their paces and um just trying to get a feel for this this new squad i've covered many 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 preseason games in my career i don't think i remember one of them they are that kind of insignificant maybe that's just the journalist point of view but they're they're just run outs man they're warm-ups you know multiple subs all that kind of stuff it's just get minutes in in the legs that's that's what they need and that's what they lacked uh, last last year, so but, I I I think that there is sorry to, to cut you off there, Jose, but I do think that there is twofold interest. I think there's more than one reason for this. Now, obviously, there's the on the field aspect, which is get some games or get another game in against an international level opponent that that gives you different style than maybe what you're used to to help you just better prepare for the season because you're seeing something else. But I also think that there's a business element to this because there are a lot of Peruvian fans and I am of Peruvian descent. I actually have my Peruvian passport. So I know a lot of Peruvian people in South Florida that aren't necessarily Inter Miami fans and that they are going to go to this game. And I've heard from them and from other people that there will be La U fans as, as Universitario de Deportes is, is commonly and affectionately known as. There are people coming from LA and other parts of the United States to come see La U, because Universitario does not play in the United States that often. Their, their seasons overlap with MLS. And I think one of the reasons this, this, and this is not information, this is just my supposition, I think one of the only reasons this friendly is happening is because the Peruvian first division should have already started by now. But because of COVID cases and and what's going on in Peru, they've, they've postponed the start of the season until February. So that gave La U an opening or an availability to have the chance to do something like this because otherwise they'd be in season by now and they wouldn't be able to play this friendly. They wouldn't be able to travel midweek to come play a friendly in Miami or in Fort Lauderdale. So I think that that is an element. I think Inter Miami is trying to tap into maybe, a, 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 I'm repeating myself here, but an untapped market that they could maybe, maybe some of these La U fans, some of these Peruvian fans can turn into Inter Miami fans you know, by being exposed to the stadium for the first time, potentially by seeing the team, if if they like what they see, if they like the vibe, the environment. So I think there's an element of that to it as well, because they are selling tickets. This is not like okay, this game's being played behind closed doors, or you know, this is this is not, you know something that the fans can't see. They are welcoming fans to this game, and obviously, there's going to be Inter Miami fans at Drive Stadium. There's no 
mistake in that. There's absolutely going to be fans, but there's also going to be Lao fans. I know that for a fact. So I do think that there's a, a business side to this friendly. But Jose, you were going to say something uh, before I interrupted you there. No, I just want to you know to touch on the on the point of the risk of of this game. Um, I, I do believe that you know there's there's um, there are positive things that can come out of this game, and if especially if Inter Miami is able to put out a good performance, um, I think that they'll be positive. But you know you want to gain some momentum as well coming into the season, and I think everybody that's going to tune in to watch this game or or that is going to go to the stadium. As an Inter Miami fan, they have a glimpse of hope that things will change, and so that's why I think it's a little bit risky in case that doesn't happen. You know that fans will will come to think again. Oh, here we go again, right? You want to stay away from that. But you know, uh, it's it's a matter as well of of how well prepared um, is Universitario. As you mentioned, they're coming in from preseason as well, getting ready to start the season, and um, and we'll see what roster they're 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 able to bring in. So there are a lot of factors, you know, but as well, when you're facing a team that you don't really know, that has a different style, that competes at a different level, you know, there's there's challenges. So that's why I just wanted to touch back on that, on, on, the, on the risky part that I mentioned, just to clarify a little bit. I do think that Inter-Miami, and this is just my, my thought, I do think Inter-Miami from a physical standpoint, I know that they're still in their second week of of preseason, but I do think from a physical standpoint, they might be able to really overwhelm Universitario. Maybe Universitario will be sharper on on the ball because they've been in preseason training longer, but I do think Inter Miami, at least in the first half, let, let's say, let's take the idea that Inter Miami goes with maybe not a first choice lineup, but a strong first lineup. I think physically Inter Miami could, could do some damage. Now I think in the second half, when a lot of substitutes are made, I imagine you'll see wholesale changes on both sides. Once that happens in the game, kind of becomes abnormal in that sense. So in the second half, anything can happen. But I think in the first half, if we see Inter Miami's close to best for 40 minutes, or 45 minutes, excuse me, I think Inter Miami stands a good chance of, of physically imposing their will. So that's where I'm going to keep my eye on. It's just those first 45 minutes and. What comes after that? You can take away takeaways from different performances. Excuse me. You can take some some observations from what you see in the second half. But once there's that many changes, the game kind of obviously is 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 completely different and changed at that point. So I'll, I'll have my eyes on the first the first half. But Lau will be missing three key players. If you're a Peruvian fan or if you're interested in hearing about what Universitario has to offer, they will be missing three of their top players who are on international duty with the Peruvian national team ahead of World Cup qualifiers that will start this week and roll into next week. And they are right back Aldo Corso, goalkeeper Jose Carvalho, and... I'm blank. Oh, and forward Alex Valera. I almost blanked on the third one. But those three players who are normal starters for Lau will not be there, so... This is not the the best Lau team they have to offer, but regardless, it should be an interesting, an interesting test. With regards to Inter Miami, Steve, what style of play do you think we'll see from them on Wednesday? This is the first chance fans, us on the media side, we will get to see this team play. I fully expect them to come out trying to be energetic, high pressing. I spoke to Mo Adams earlier in the week at training, and he said that that's what they've been working on. It sounded a lot like what Phil Neville initially wanted to do in 2021 when he arrived to South Florida before he had to change his idea and his his vision for the team and the style because of the players he had available, something he openly discussed with us. So I think we're going to see an Inter-Miami team that's going to press, that's going to buzz around the field. But is that what you expect or do you think we'll see a bit different because of where they are in preseason? Yeah, a a mixture of, of both really. Yeah, I mean, remember fitness levels aren't, aren't at optimum yet. They've only really just started getting getting back into it. I think the cooler temperatures will will, will help, certainly if they're going to have a high-pressing sort of, in, you know, intensity about their game. Um, obviously, you know, no Luis Morgan. We've got Campanos now. We've got Emerson Rodriguez. Um, is, is Mota, is Mota a, available to start now or not? 
I mean, he's he's in training now, so like I guess it's just a decision of you know how fit yeah, he I mean, is. Look, they've got he... they've got some creative talents in in the in the squad now, and we will. This is our first sort of glimpse without Morgan, without Pizarro. I know you, you guys are probably crying into your laptops now just thinking about that, but <laughs> you have to deal with it, I'm afraid. Um, and you know, no Matuidi as well. Um, so it's going to be a new look team. So it's I think it's interesting as a spectator. I think it's interesting as a journalist, and I think you know for. For someone like Phil Neville, I'm going to put my football manager computer game hat on. You know, this is the time where you're looking at how these players, you know, can integrate into into a system and, and into a squad. And it's not just one system. They'll be working on multiple systems to cope with different things that happen and scenarios that happen throughout the game. So um, it's, it should be uh, it should be interesting. I just, you know, listen, if they win 7-0, then, then great. If they lose 2-0... Still, no, you know, no real difference. But they want to get off with it. just a good performance and, and some some goals at least, maybe. You love yourself some football manager, huh? I think you've name dropped football manager since we've returned for the new year, like at least five times, it, at least. I just feel like I'm Phil Neville now. You know, I feel like I'm sort of a wannabe Phil Neville. And and anyone else, if they want to join, you play football manager. It's a very immersive uh, game that you can really understand exactly what's going on if you are a manager. But if you've got less time then i wouldn't bother because it soaks up way too much time well jose let's 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 go to you here in terms of the style of play because i i feel like steve could go on and on about his football manager career actually we've had off the the mic conversations and he's definitely gone in a lot of detail about his football <laughs> manager experience jose what do you think we can expect from a stylistic standpoint from a tactical standpoint from inter miami on wednesday night well, I would agree with you that the first 45 minutes, and that's what usually happens in friendly matches, the first 45 minutes are um, basically what you, what you can count on, right? Those are those are the, those first 45 minutes, that starting lineup pretty much gives you an idea of, of where Phil's head is at. So um, I would expect, you know, uh, a, a team that is a little bit more aggressive, that um, doesn't necessarily hold on to the ball as much, but that they are a little bit more direct in terms of how do they connect moving forward. Um, I think they do have talent, and and I'm referring to players that can be aggressive with the ball and moving forward. I don't know if they have enough to hold on to the ball and build out of the back. That's my question, and that's something that I'll be looking into in the game because I think they do have quality through the wings, um, of course, they do have Gonzalo, but Gonzalo is this. He's not necessarily a player that will help you from the build-up all the way from the back. He, he's most likely to finish things up. So, you know, there's a lot of things. There's a lot of moving parts still. And since this, the, the turnover was so big from one season to the other, I think we can very easily end up, you know, uh, finding not only uh, a, a, a tactic, uh, um, yeah, a tactic setup. With four in the back, maybe he'll try five again. You know, that's something that it's really intriguing to me about this team because they had so much success last year that, you know, that could be something that Phil can entertain coming into 2022. So, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. I think if you're a fan, you have to go with the mentality into this game to learn a little bit more about your team tactically. What exactly is this team going to do in 2022? There's a lot of questions that I think are going to be answered um, tomorrow night against Universitario. So I disagree with you in the sense that I do think that this team is going to look to keep possession. I don't think that they're going to try to be so direct and one of the reasons why I say that is because I'll go back to the point I made earlier I think Phil Neville is going to try to implement his preferred style of play and the vision he had when he first arrived in South Florida because if you go back to last year he talked about having a possession-based team team that was was high pressing uh, and energetic and could buzz around the field then with time as he saw his players more up close and personal and in different games and practice sessions you know, he, he opened up and said, I, I believe after the first four games of the season, when we talked about it in a press conference, that, you know, he has to change the style a bit to, to I think, the, actually, the word he used was adaptable. He had to adapt the, the game plan and the style to the players he had at his disposal. Now, with this big overhaul, we've talked about how this is a younger team. And with, with youth comes energy, speed. So I think that they are going to defensively be a high pressing team. And I think with the ball, they're going to want to be the possession based team that 
Inter Miami wanted to be initially, or Phil Neville wanted Inter Miami to be initially in 2021. And one of the, and you don't even have to take my word for it. This is what midfielder Mo Adams told me earlier in the week about how they've been practicing and how they've been playing so far because they did have a friendly over the weekend against the Columbus crew. Quote, we want to dominate the ball in possession, of course. Dictate the play, be able to move the ball, switch the ball from side to side, be able to penetrate through the middle, but then obviously out of possession to be a high-pressing team to try and win the ball back as soon as we can. That has kind of been a theme that we've been working on. It's something that we are going to continue working throughout the whole preseason, end quote. So obviously what you practice doesn't necessarily always translate to the field. That's why we saw Inter Miami not be this type of team last year. Once the ball starts rolling, you have opponents, you, you know, the, the plans can go out the window fairly quickly if, if the opponent is just better at executing their game plan. That causes you to change, obviously, your, your setup. So I think that's going to be the game plan for Inter Miami. We'll see if they're able to execute it. Again, I think from a physical standpoint, Inter Miami might be able to do some damage on Universitario. I do think from a maybe technical standpoint, there's questions to be asked because Lau does have some technical technical players. So we will see how that unfolds. Let's quickly change gears to some player news. Because late last week on Friday, I reported that DeAndre Yedlin was an Inter-Miami target. The team was looking at him at possibly bringing him over from Europe uh, on a free transfer because he, he has come to an agreement to rip up his contract with Turkish power Galatasaray. And he's now a free agent. He's able to come back to MLS if he wants to. And if he does, he would have to come through the MLS allocation order, which we know Inter Miami has the number one spot for after their trade of Christian McCoon. Now, since Friday, other news has unfolded. And from what I'm hearing, as well as what's been put out there by other media members, other colleagues, is that other teams have stepped up their interest in DeAndre Yedlin. And what I've heard is that right now, it's just from a financial standpoint, it's become more of a challenge than maybe it was a week or two ago. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. There was interest in him, but if they don't sign him, they have a hole to fill there at right back. So I'll go back to you, Jose. If they were able to sign DeAndre Yedlin, you know, how big of a boost would that be for the back line? Someone with experience, a U.S. national team defender, he's played in MLS before. And he's still fairly young and very, very speedy. So what, you know, if he is signed, what do you think he brings? And if he's not signed, how quickly do they need to find somebody else because they're running out of time to get someone in here? Well, absolutely. You know, he's a, he's a national team player. He's, he's one of the players uh, on the radar for, for, for the World Cup this year. So um, you want to have those type of players on your team. Absolutely. He'll be a great addition. And you know, he'll, he'll bring a, a little bit of a flair as well to the team, right? Uh, that connection with the with the U.S. fan base, and um, you know, I think he's a quality player still. Um, and and but uh, honestly, like I'm not gonna lie to you guys, it, it's 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 a, it's important for him to remain playing at the high at the highest level. So, you know, especially if he wants to go to the World Cup. So. Um, it is what it is right now with with Yetlin. It, it'll be great to have him, but you know you, you're not going to blame blame him for taking some other opportunities someplace else. And um, you know, yeah, listen, I think you know there's quality within the within the backs in in the U.S. I, I'm not I'm not that concerned. I I, I do think that um, of course uh, the the sanctions still play a factor every time Inter Miami goes out there and and tries to. To sign a player, but I think I, I do believe in Chris Henderson so far that he goes, he's going to be able to deliver, and 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 I'm sure he's not thinking um, DeAndre Jetlin is not no longer an option for us, and now I'm I'm going to start looking for players. I, I I'm sure he has already a couple of options on the table that he's thinking of. So I don't think that it's that concerning. I think you know there's there's quality within that position here, and 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 I do believe they're going to find a player that, that they like and that's going to be good for the team. Interesting, interesting. I, I think it's their most glaring need right now. I think they, they need to add a right back. Uh, definitely a starting caliber right back because I don't think they have one right now. Steve, Primo, what do you think? Does Inter Miami right now on this roster, do you think that they have someone that could be a starter over the course of the season or do you think they need to go out and get someone, be it a DeAndre Yedlin or be it a different type of player for that right back spot? Yeah, I mean, you know, Yedlin's a, 
Yeah, Lynn's an interesting one, isn't he? Um, yeah, good, good going forward, susceptible going, you know, at the back maybe defensively. Certainly when he was at Newcastle, some some guys I know that that, that cover the team, um, you know, they said he was a little bit susceptible at, at the back. You know, Harvey Neville is, is a right back, but obviously untested at this level. So I think that would be a risk, I guess, to to go in with him. Um, I'm I'm just we, we're trying to find out about you know what exactly is happening with Yedlin. I, I, I'm not sure whether it's not it's a financial problem, whether or not there's something else happening, but we can't really get any of our sources to confirm or or deny right now. But I, I do like the fact I've that heard it's a money thing. I have heard it's a money thing. Yeah, we we'll just we we'll just have to have to wait and see. But he fits the bill in terms of certainly you know experience playing the Premier League. He's obviously had he's been in Galatasaray recently. So Turkish, Turkish league is a high level. I would probably say on a higher than, than MLS, I, I would have thought. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they, they've they've done well replacing other p- places, people higher up, higher up the pitch. But they need to make sure that it's going to be a pretty new look defense. They need, they need to get it right. Well, Hull City is interested, but they're in 19th place in the English Championship. So they're in the relegation conversation, although they, they're a good 10 points away. If he wants to continue playing at a higher level, he probably stays in, in Europe. If he wants to earn a little bit more coin, he probably stays in Europe. There's, you know, if, if he wants to come back to the United States, he's been abroad for for eight years. And if Chris Henderson, who he's very familiar with because the two have worked, they two work together in Seattle. Chris Henderson helped sign Yedlin to his first professional deal uh, back in 2013, if, if I'm not mistaken. If he wants to, if if Henderson can work his magic a little bit, and if Yedlin is allured by the prospects of potentially coming back to the United States, then I mean Miami could be a good fit. But right now, it's it's looking a little less likely than maybe a week ago. Now let's quickly switch gears on a few other players because there are a few other players to talk about, and we'll start with Breck Shea because one of the w- most wild things, one of the wildest things I've ever seen in my. 11 plus years covering professional soccer and sports in general was seeing Breck Shea pick out a snake from the bushes at Inter Miami training before he came over for media availability and trying to help get it off of the the field, off the pitch. Steve, what were your thoughts on that? Because that obviously, it was just mind boggling to see that, right? It kind of, it kind of was uh, surreal was probably the best word it I used to describe it. I was I was actually sat down with Kieran Gibbs at the time, uh, having a having a nice chat, and then Breck Shea just sort of wandered past us, and then he sort of looked into the bush, and then all of a sudden he, he pulled out a snake with his bare hands. Now, um, you know, I'm not a massive animal lover, so I probably wouldn't be pulling a snake out of the bushes with my bare hands. I would have probably been running uh, towards Miami uh, <laughs> as soon as I, so I would have seen it. But yeah, definitely up there, probably was some of the weirdest one of the weirdest moments I'd ever been. Not uh, seen at a training ground, not interviewing Kieran Gibbs. That was great. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Breck, Snake, Breck, Snake, Man, Shay, Jake the Snake Roberts has slightly before your time, maybe, Franco, you no, don't no, know I about know who, I know Snake. who Jake the Snake Roberts is. Um, there's got to be some sort of WWF, WWE link there. Maybe once, if we get Breck Shay on one time, maybe we can, uh, we can just talk about snakes for 20 minutes. But yeah, a weird one for sure. He's, the snake he, pulling, not Breck. He said he just wanted to see the snake. You know, he said someone pointed it out, right. and, and he, he just wanted to see the snake because he's had pet snakes and stuff. So, you know, he, sure. I mean, there are, there are alligators that in in the lake behind my behind my house, but I don't want to go and go into the lake and go and see them. Well, you know not, what I mean. Well, you're, you're not Breck Shea though, so you know, see, that's, exactly. see that's, that's, that's your first mistake. Jose, what did you think of that whole thing? Because you were at training as well. What was your perspective there from it? This news actually kind of uh, revoto. It just it made it it spread to. Uh, Outlets in in Europe, outlets in England, outlets you know bigger outlets in the United States, national outlets, not even traditional sports outlets. This this made the news in a few places. So, Jose, what did you think of just that moment that we all experienced last week in training? Well, for some reason, I was not surprised. I kind of come to expect Break Shade to do those kind of kinds of things, even though I'd never seen it before. But you know, yeah, it was it was fun. It was fun to watch the way he handled the snake. I don't think I would have come close to the snake. But, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it took me back to a few years ago, same place, but completely different scenario, of course, because back in uh, 2016, I think, around that time, you know, where the training ground for Inter Miami is right now, there used to be a baseball field next to Locker Stadium. And the, for a lot of those strikers used to train there. 
And so we saw all kinds of things there. And uh, I do remember one time Walter Ramirez, a former player for um, for the for a lot of little strikers, caught a, an, an iguana there. And he said, uh, he's Honduran, by the way, just like me. And he said, well, I used to eat this this, this type of uh, iguana when I was back home in, in Honduras. So I was telling him, so are you going to do it now? No, not anymore. So, you know, things happen around that area. Um, I, I do believe Brakeshay did enjoy that as much as we did reporting about it not getting close to the snake, at least for me. I don't know what, what you guys think about snakes, but um, it, it was fun. It was fun. And something that I think we'll, we'll remember for a while. Breck handled it like a pro, man. Like he's been doing it for forever because I, I walked over there because I was like, oh, he's, he's got this thing under control. He had the, the hand on the head. So, you know, it, it couldn't, it couldn't bite. I don't know if it's if it even a snake that bites, but you know, he was holding it by the, by its neck. So, you know, it, it can't, it can't rig, wiggle away from him. He had the whole technique down pat. Uh, and it was definitely, definitely a moment. I don't think we'll forget any time soon. Let's quickly just go back to on the field because we also got a chance to interview Emerson Rodriguez and Leonardo Campana for the first time. They were officially announced after we recorded our last pod and we spoke to them for a bit. Both very affable guys. Uh, Leonardo Campana speaks English in addition to his Spanish. And he was able to do the interview in, in both languages. Emerson only speaks Spanish right now, but a very fun loving and happy go lucky type of guy jose i will start with you what was your biggest takeaway from either of their interviews um well uh, i'm gonna start with the emerson rivaldo um uh, interview because that was really really funny that when he mentioned that um you know his his family they're all brazilian football fans that he likes the jogo bonito and that um you know he's named after um, Brazilian players and that his brothers are also named after Brazilian players and that he wanted to name his own name and that's the only thing that was missing. I think that tells you a little bit of, about the energy that Emerson brings to this team. Um, it was a lot of fun and um, you know it's, it's just great to see these young players come into the team and they already look like they are pretty much you know um, they are very comfortable with the media, with the facilities. Um, you can see Emerson on social media that he's very happy to be here. So, you know, those are all little things that end up, you know, helping a lot in, in this period of adjustment that every player needs to go to, especially when you move to a new country. So I really like that interview. I think, you know, he's a player that I don't see him as a starter. I, I do think that he's going to make progress within the season. He might end up becoming a starter late in the season. But as of right now, I think, you know, he's a, he's a player that is going to contribute in the second half. Steve, what was your biggest takeaway from those two interviews? Something on Campana maybe? Or were you, I mean, I imagine it had to be on Campana because Emerson spoke in, in predominantly Spanish or all exclusively in Spanish. And I know you don't, your Spanish isn't 100% there yet. I mean, no, it's not there at all. Um, I wasn't <laughs> actually there on, <laughs> I wasn't, uh, I wasn't at the, tra I wasn't at training the other day, so I cannot comment. Actually, you might have been while you were with. You were there. You were there. You were talking to Kieran, so you weren't even. You weren't, uh, you weren't there for those for those interviews. That's my my bad. Fish to fry, my bad. Fish to fry. <laughs> no, if, any, if there's any English player, that's it. I'm all, I'm all over it. I'm actually going to try and get an interview with Martin Patterson, the uh, new assistant manager. Because he's from Northern Ireland. So there you go. So, um, but no, I'm, I'm excited to see these these guys play. Um, especially you know, Campanos obviously has been at Wolves and comes with a you know a good pedigree. And he just seems to be a, a more ready. I think you know someone like Carranza was relatively raw and I thought they were going to turn in something. It looks like a panic just like a couple of levels up from that in terms of him experience wise. So I'm, I'm keen to see them play. And I'm speaking to a, a journalist in Colombia the, the other day. They really rate uh, Emerson Rodriguez. So um, yeah, let's, let's see what they're about. I'm, I'm curious to see how they both do. Uh, but you know, since, since Jose touched on, on Emerson, I'll touch on Leonardo a little bit because you know, the way that, it all transpired and unfolded for him to come to Inter Miami. I thought it was interesting. He said he was on vacation for the holidays with his family. He has family in South Florida. And that during that time here, he was here for Christmas and the New Year's, he got a call. It was Inter Miami. They wanted to bring him on board. And he did not hesitate because he loves South Florida and, and he's looking for some consistency, some so a rhythm. To get into a regular rhythm of minutes and, and playing time, he's bounced around a few different clubs as of late on loan from Wolverhampton Wanderers. So he's looking for somewhere to really just establish himself. He said he likes the project here. So 
he seems motivated. He seems really excited as well to be here. And since he has family, you have to imagine that his adaptation period will be maybe quicker than would otherwise be the case. So keep an eye out on him because maybe he could be a surprise breakout star for the team in 2022. Now, quickly, let's just quickly touch on one more player that was in the news as of late. That's Nicolas Figal. He has been officially sold to Boca Juniors. So, And that's on a permanent transfer. So... Nicolas Figal's time with Inter Miami is done. There's no chance of him returning, you know, at, like there is maybe with Leandro Gonzalez Pires or Rodolfo Pizarro, who are on loan with their respective new teams. Well, how would you how would you sum up Figal's time with Inter Miami? I will start with you, Cinco, because I know you wrote a piece on him and, and put out a tweet about his time here. Yeah, I think you know overall. I think Figal, you know, he had a a good run with Inter Miami, over 40 matches played. I think um, last year, I don't think he was able to perform at a level that uh, we all hoped for. But, um, and I'm going to explain this because, you know, it's easy to think that because uh, defensively Inter Miami was so good at times um, that, you know, everybody did well and perform at a high level. But I do believe that Figal could have done a little bit more. I think the system helped every single defender on the team. But on the 1v1 battles, I think it was a little bit, you know, hesitant on those. Um, I, I just, and mentally, it didn't seem like he was in the game at times. Um, so I, I think he did a lot better in his first year. I don't know if, if he was um, a little bit more comfortable with Diego Alonso. But I think overall, you know, he did what he did, needed to do. And uh, and I'm happy he gets to play with Boca. I mean, that's, that's a, a big name in football. And I think, you know, it, it goes back to the scenario that we talked about a few weeks ago with LGP. Going from Inter-Miami to River Plate, going from Inter-Miami to Boca Juniors, it's an upgrade. Steve, before I get your thoughts, there is some breaking Inter Miami news that just happened here while we're recording, and I will share it here on the pod. And that is that Inter Miami has revealed the squad numbers, the player numbers for 2022. And the most notable thing here is that Gonzalo Higuain will no longer be wearing number nine. He will be donning the number 10. Leonardo Campana will be rocking number nine. So interesting. I think that's interesting because we've talked about Gonzalo Higuain's positioning, whether he'll be more of a 10 this year. So I think that's of note, but we can maybe dive into that a little bit later. Stick on Sticking on Figal, Steve, how would you sum up the two seasons he played for the team? I thought he, yeah, he was he was pretty solid. I think he improved as he as he kind of went along. He seemed to have a good understanding with Gonzalez Perez, um, but I think you know I think in the end they probably did you know good business as as Jose rightly said. Good move for him. They've if they've got some money for him as well. Um, so I guess that that all that all counts, and um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, just a, a good player is is irreplaceable. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think so. That he clearly likes you know the younger guys coming through and Beaker particularly. Um, so you know the test will be on how this new look defence. You know, with the 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 up midfield and the attack has been kind of remoulded, but they've lost some key guys with Gonzalez Perez and and Figal. You know, both leaving. That was the sort of centre of the. Of the back line, um, so you know they've they've got work to do there to try and recreate that you know um, you know feeling that they had over the last couple of years. A, a decent player, but you know uh, you know everyone the, the club will move on. I don't think it's a, a necessarily a, bl- a blow really. So for me, it, I thought he was a stud in the first two games of the team's inception. Those first two games, I thought he was maybe the best player that Inter Miami had before the the pandemic hit. Then once he was switched to right back out of necessity and was juggling in between those two spots, his his performance levels dipped a bit. Last year also had his ups and downs, but I thought once he started playing the sweeper role in the back five, thought he was quietly solid. So overall, I'd give him a, a, a passing grade. I don't know. I don't think it's a, an A plus or an A, but I think he had he was overall solid. I, I would say that. He was a bit temperamental as well. And that's something I've heard from people I've spoken to in and around the team. And, and one example was, uh, I can't remember the exact game, but it was in Diego Alonso's season, the first year. And he got poked in the eye. If he got poked in the eye, I don't know if it was, I, I imagine it was inadvertent, um, but I don't know if he took it that way. And, you know, he had a, a rush of blood to the head. And 
later on in the first half, he, he commits a penalty kick foul. And I believe, and again, my memory could be a little bit foggy here, but I believe Luis Robles saved that penalty kick and, you know, didn't come back to bite Inter Miami in that moment. But, but... Diego Alonso realizing he, that Figa lost his cool, he pulled him at halftime and subbed him out and brought somebody else in. So he was a bit temperamental uh, in in that way. And, you know, that was something that was touched on by Phil Neville this this past season, saying that, you know, Figa is someone that when they lose, he, you know, it really, really impacts him. So uh, it really stays with him and sticks with him. So, you know, it, it, that, that could be a criticism against him. But I think, again, over the course of his two seasons, I thought he was more... Uh, on the good side than the bad side. I thought his his contributions were were a net positive. So he was on the, he goes on to Boca Juniors. Inter Miami will go with some younger center backs, and we'll see what pairing or what what trident they go with at that position. But let's. I would say one thing, Franco. That's not necessarily bad. I mean, I, I hope Inter Miami has some temperamental players as well. They just need to know how to control, right? Sure, sure. Because, I mean, it's a fine line. It's a fine line with you know with 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 yeah. him, though, of course. So, I mean, maybe he he didn't harness that in the best way. Um, obviously, if you're getting if you're giving up a penalty kick because you feel you got you know poked in the eye, you know that's obviously not not the best for the team. So obviously, have to have to harness that and manage that. But again, I think over the course of his his two years, it was more positive than negative. But let's leave it there for now, Jose. Let's leave it there for now, Steve, because we have a very special guest. We are going to speak to. An Inter Miami original. We're going to interview him as our very first guest on Miami Total Football Radio in 2022. Stay tuned for that interview. It's coming after this. Okay, guys, so we said we had some treats for you this year, and on this week's show, we have your very first one. He's an 11-year MLS veteran, an Inter-Miami original who has been here in South Florida from the start in 2020, one of the glues in the locker room, and someone who might just be the player that I've seen wear the most sunscreen on a daily practice session. It's Victor Ulloa. Victor, how are you doing today? Hey, guys, how's everybody doing? I'm doing good. Good, man. Good. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you coming on and taking the time. We wanted to get some of you guys on over the course of the year, and we thought, who would be better than Victor Ulloa? Nobody. So we wanted to have you on because you have great perspective of Inter Miami. You've been here, like I said before, from the start in 2020. So I know you can give us a lot of perspective and context and just what the team's going through, another transition here into 2022. So, uh, you know, before we get into all the nitty gritty about the team, I have I have to ask you about your son, who is equal parts adorable and hilarious. On Instagram, <laughs> I see you on on the stories all the time when he's at soccer practice and he's kicking the cones over and everything. Does that is that mom's temperament, dad's temperament, or a little bit of both? I think I like to say it's mom's. Okay. Like to say it's mom's. <laughs> okay. Okay. He loves it. He has fun. We're we're a work in progress. Trying to trying to get him to listen, but he's three, so he must, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit difficult at this age, but is he is he showing promise, Victor? Is he showing is he showing a few skills or not? Oh, he's he's great. He's a beast. <laughs> he's got a lot of energy for sure, for sure. He's like running around, kicking the cones over. It's hilarious. If you if you guys have not seen Victor Uyoa's son, follow Victor Uyoa on Instagram and watch his stories when he takes his son to practice. I promise you, it, it's it's a great view, great content, great content. But every, every Monday, every Monday night, every Monday night. Okay, so there you go. On Monday night, watch Victor Yo's story. <laughs> You'll see some great, great content, and it is, it is adorable. It's equal parts adorable as it is funny. But anyway, let's 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 dive into to the nitty gritty, Victor. You don't want to take up too much of your time. And obviously, this team is in transition. A lot of faces have changed. The team is much younger now. You've been here from the start. How would you compare? this team, this iteration of Inter-Miami to what we've seen before in the last two years? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, obviously we have a very, very young group. Uh, we brought in a lot of, they brought in a lot of young players um, with not too much experience. And um, 
it's good because we we see from week one from the get go the the hunger the desire for them that they want to be successful that they want to show something make statements and show everybody how they play and and play for this team so it's been a good first week of of training it's been good to get to know everybody a little bit closer you know it's important to to get those bonds and build that chemistry off the field because it definitely translates on the field how, how how long does it take victor in your experience to to really gel teams together i guess it uh, you know the season when you first started obviously covid hit so that that was a real problem but now with now we're dealing with the pandemic is that is that going to help do you think in terms of just trying to gel everyone together absolutely i think what one of the things that we had to struggle with or we did struggle with a lot especially in, in this club is uh covid and how it affected our pre-seasons in past years and we weren't able to get the sessions, the games that we needed. Uh, this time around, like you said, now we're we're dealing with it, we're living with it, and adapting and and getting a lot of games in. Uh, we have a lot of games lined up, and we're very very excited to to get going because those games are going to help us bump, build those bonds and build that chemistry and get to know each other a little bit better. So that for the home opener, we're ready to go. We come out flying, and then hopefully we can get some wins here in front of our, our amazing fans. I was just going to say, you reminded me that you know this time last year, the, the preseason was a nightmare, wasn't it? And they didn't really, you didn't really play many games at all. There were a lot cancelled. That was obviously, we we thought that was going to be a problem, and it, it doesn't help, does it? Like you say, you need those runner games. Yeah, whenever you can. Uh, I mean, training is is very good. Training it helps you build your base for fitness. But you need those matches, you need those games to get that match intensity, that match rhythm. And and yeah, unfortunately, last year around this time we were we were struggling in, in doing so because of of the the virus pandemic. But um, this time around, like things turned around, and and like like I said, we're learning to adapt with it, to live with it. And there's protocols in place that the club put, that the league put, and that are very good to to protect us and for the safety of us, so that we can we can do our jobs on the field and and play those games against opponents that aren't aren't just each other. Um, Victor, I, I wanted to ask you about about relationships, right, with your new teammates, because, you know, some people uh, like to do things a certain way. And, and I'm assuming that's the same in, in a football team. So when you have new guys coming in, they're all professionals. But um, how hard is it to gel and how long does it take? And is there something in particular that you like to do? Are you the type of player that will go and reach out to the players and talk to them, try to get to know them? Because, you know, it's it's a matter of relationships in a soccer team as well. I think you explained it perfectly. I think not just in sports, but in, in any any type of work that you do, whenever somebody new comes into your circle or people that you don't know, it's a little bit reserved at first, whether they are, whether you are. So guys that have been here like myself, uh, especially we have, we have a group chat, that a player group chat that we create. And uh, yeah, once we started announcing players, I started reaching out. I asked for their contact info. I added them to the group. I, I spoke to the other guys that were here, Gregor, Gonzalo, Breck, just welcoming them and telling them that we're ready to play, ready to meet them and and tar- starting to build those relationships because they're very important to to break that ice from the get go. And the sooner we can do that, the the better we can build those relationships and really gel and become a brotherhood, which is what we want to have in the, in this team. And It'll help us on the field, like I said, it'll transfer to to results and to fighting for each other on on the pitch. You know, you you took it on your own, on your own to, to to sort those WhatsApp groups out, or is that something? You know, is that delegated? I guess guys, people don't really know exactly you know the working sometimes of a of a soccer squad is interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's something honestly that I mean I feel that since I've been here since the very beginning and with all my experience that I have in the league and in different teams, and I'm able to speak both languages, thankfully, English and Spanish, I manage it very well. So yeah, I take I took that upon myself to to get those guys introduced into the group and for people to start a conversation so that we could start that banter so that we could, just to break that ice, like I said, because I think that that helps the group come together and that'll help us come together quicker rather than later because we're a brand new group. We have a lot of players and, and we need to build those relationships. They're important. I really believe that they're just as important as the work that we do when we're on, on the field with the coach. And the messages are flying around. It's, it's lively or it goes quiet or, or what? People sending pictures, jokes, or you just keep it in touch? How does it work? Yeah, just a little bit of everything. Sometimes it goes a little bit quiet. Sometimes there's a lot of banter. Sometimes a lot of people joke. Sometimes it's serious. Sometimes it's information. It, it's just, it just varies depending. But obviously, we try to keep it just fun and outgoing and, and try to get everybody involved and everybody to, to have that space to, to say whatever they want. Victor. Now I'm wondering if uh, sorry, Franco, but I do have to ask this question to 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 Victor because I'm wondering if the players have talked in that WhatsApp group about you know a few days ago um, we were um, interviewing 
um, Emerson Rivaldo Rodriguez, and he mentioned something very funny that I got a lot of reaction, and I'm sure the fans uh, had had a laugh with this. You know, he said that within his family, um, they they do love Brazilian football, and that's why he was named Emerson Rivaldo, and his brothers were named Danielson. And and he said that the one thing missing is for him to name his son Neymar. Have you guys talked about this? This was this was something really really funny. And I guess some of the new guys that are coming in that have the right attitude. They're very funny. At least in social media, they look to be very funny and gelling into the team. Yeah, no. With Emerson, uh, we recently found out uh, what you guys found out that his his family is very very Brazilian orientated, and and so now Gonzalo, especially Gonzalo, Gonzalo every morning is joking with him. We call him both by, by both his names and just tell him to dance some 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 samba and it's beginning to get a little bit lively in that end and yeah we brought in a, a bunch of good guys i mean great guys with great attitudes and and ready to to put in the work victor my early impression and you're you're in the locker room and you just gave us some good insight there but he does emerson does seem to be very jovial very happy-go-lucky type of type of guy which is definitely probably a plus there for uh for locker room banter amongst you guys. But I, I do want to switch back to just on the field very quickly to something that the other guys asked you about. Um, because something that that I took away from that first day of preseason training and the press conferences we had afterwards with Phil Neville uh, and, and and Chris Henderson and Gonzalo Higuain, something that was repeated was patience. That fans might need to have some patience with this team to really develop and, and be what it can be because there are so many new pieces in place. And like you said, it does take time and it takes games takes meaningful games as well as preseason games uh to to really find that chemistry and develop that chemistry i, I know it's probably hard to put a, a number on but you know how much patience do you think will be required is this going to be something that takes over the course of the entire season do you think it's something that can can click fairly quickly or is this something that's going to be a process in 2022 yeah i mean i think the most important thing right now is is like you said and you mentioned is that we need to have patience and and because we're a new team, but it only goes so far, right? At, at some point, we need to get results and we need to get wins, and we're just taking it day by day. The mo- the goal right here is the home opener against Chicago, and once that game comes, we'll we'll have to be ready and prepared, and I think we'll have to start winning some games. Um, we're all competitive, we all want to win, and uh, we have a couple of weeks to to get ready, and we have a lot of games coming up in order to prepare. But I think when they spoke about that patience, it was just uh, to take the process day by day and mm-hmm. to take these games, these next preseason games as giving them opportunities to grow. We have a lot of young guys, especially in the back line, to to get those experiences and to support them. And a little bit added, not pressure, but added responsibility for guys like myself, Gregore, Gonzalo, Breck, to to support those guys and to give them that that backing. You know, we were we were there at one point and we had that backing from other guys, experienced guys. So it's just important for us to to have that support of them and, and maybe not those frustrations that it's normal to get because we're we're competitors and we want to win. Right. So I would say the target deadline is just the, the goal. Our goal is the home opener. The home opener, we want to be ready to fly, ready to go, and and hopefully we start on the right foot and get those three points that we need at home. I wanted to ask you about a game in specific, and that's this Wednesday's game against Universitario de Deportes from Peru, which is where my family's from, which is a, a nice little wrinkle for me personally to see that I have a lot of friends texting me and then calling me, telling me that they're going to go. What do you What do you guys expect from this? Because this is Inter Miami's first international game in its history, its first international friendly. Uh, I imagine you guys don't know a whole lot about the opponent, but what do you expect from this game? What are you guys looking to get out of this game on Wednesday? Wednesday night at Drive Pink Stadium, which will be the first opportunity for fans to see this very revamped Inter Miami side up close and personal. Yeah, we're just, I mean, expecting a lot of intensity. We want to be an intense team. We've been working very, very hard uh, physically, so we want to make sure we we're building those minutes up to to keep going. We we played 20 minutes, 20 minutes, whether that's the coach's decision to play us a little bit longer. Um, just building the base, building the base and, and getting the movements, getting to know each other a little bit better. We're excited to have our fans in our, in our stadium and, and hopefully we give, them, we give them a good show. You know, we don't know much about the opponent, but we've heard that they have a very good team and very good players. And it'll be nice to play against uh, somebody other than an MLS team and somebody other than ourselves. Uh, our first international game is going to be it's going to be fun, and they and they will have fans in the stands. I can guarantee you that because I have a lot of Peruvian friends that that maybe aren't into Miami fans, but they're looking forward to going to this one. And maybe this is a, a chance for you guys to maybe convert some of those those fans into Inter Miami fans. But I know Steve had another question there. 
No, I just expect Franco to be wearing his Peru shirt <laughs> wearing the, in the press box, which definitely no, should never, be banned. No, never that, but, never that. But, uh, you know, if Franco, uh, just, just touching it, when, you, when you're playing a team like, like, like you are on Wednesday, you don't know too much about them. It's... Is the video analysis and stuff like that pre-game, is that kind of re- reduced a little bit just because you don't know too much? Are you watching tapes or are you just trying to go on what on what you guys have been feeling in preseason so far? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the video analysis is a little bit more on the work that we do, uh, sure. especially in trainings and, and what the coach wants to see or areas of improvement. But yeah, in this case, we don't know much about them. Uh, we know that they're going to be an intense team. We know that uh, it's going to be a little bit different game rhythm than what we're used to against the MLS team. So so it's going to be fun. It's going to be a good experience for all of us to, to get good minutes in. And like I said, to keep building and, and keep building those building blocks to get ready for, for the important goal, which is the, the home opener. You know, back in the day, um, it, it was it was a little bit strange, strange to have a friendly so early in preseason. So I guess this talks about how things have changed throughout the years. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about your off season program and how that helps you um, to be ready to get on the field against a uh, you know an opponent at, at the international level? You know, it, it would seem a little bit risky years ago, but I guess now you know players are coming in and ready to go. Yeah, I think uh, the the club did a very great job this year and and given us uh, individual programs. Uh, I think Don came in and and did a great job in in order to to keep us fit and keep our base and keep our weights and and we did gym work, we did field work, we did ball work. It, it was all really really uh, very well put. And like you said, I mean, we came into preseason officially and and our we got going. I mean, we did our fitness test and our group killed it. A lot of guys did very well and we were ready to go. I think uh, the best way to get the, the chemistry going between the guys and, and, and the new group is to get games. And um, very early on, uh, the better now, like you mentioned, guys are ready to go and ready to play and, and ready to, to prove to the coach and to the team that they, they should be playing. Victor, on Wednesday, like I mentioned before, this will be the first chance that us on the media side, fans get a chance to see this version, this iteration of Inter-Miami. What can we expect from a style standpoint? I know you don't, you're not going to give away all your secrets tactically, but what can we expect from a style of play standpoint? Because I, I spoke to Mo Adams uh, earlier this week. I spoke to Ian Frey. And a lot of the things that they said in terms of what Phil is asking of them in their positions sounded very similar to what Phil wanted to incorporate at the beginning of, of last year. And with time and with him becoming more familiar with the players that he had, he said you know, he, he had to change his his vision or his style to better suit the players he had at his disposal. But it sounds to me like he's might be going back to what he wanted to do initially, which is maybe more high pressing, more energy, more possession based soccer. Is that what you guys have been working on, or what stylistically can Inter Miami fans expect on Wednesday and through the course of 2022? Yeah, you know, the, uh, the past week and a half, we've really focused on a lot of defensive work and, uh, like you just mentioned, a lot of high press. We want to be a very, very intense team, and and hopefully you guys see that. I mean, you guys will see that uh, a Wednesday night. And um, with the ball, we want to be dominant. We want to create scoring opportunities. We want to score a lot of goals, and and we want to concede as least as possible. So that that starts with our number nine, with our striker, and our guys up top, Robbie and the seven, the elevens, in, in order to to be our first line of defenders. And and reco- if, we re- if we can recover the ball closer to the opponent's box, we're going to create that many more opportunities, and it's that much less running that we have to do. So it's something that we've been focused on and and you guys will see the the difference on in, in Wednesday night. Cool. And just to start wrapping up here, Victor, and again, we appreciate you taking the time here to speak to us. How are you doing? How, how are you from a health perspective? I know you've been training in full, but obviously last year, towards the end of last season, you finished uh, on the sidelines. You, you seemed like you were on the mend and you were almost close to coming back, but we didn't get to see you during that that late push, that late stretch because of injury. So how are you doing? And, and how frustrating was that, obviously, to not be able to take part in, in that final run of games there for Inter Miami in 2021? Yeah, I mean, it, it killed me, to be honest. I, I don't think any any of us are ready when we, we expect to get injured. Uh, there are all surprises. You don't know why. We prepare yourself well, and it just happens, you know. But it was very, very frustrating. Uh, I wanted to be with the guys on the field, and I couldn't. And I missed 12 games. I've never missed that many games in my career and never had this type of injury. So it was, it was definitely a, a new experience for me. Uh, now looking back, obviously I'm I'm a very optimistic guy, so I like to see the positive things in it, mm-hmm. and it's just another experience gained. Uh, what I can do to to help, even if I can't be on the field outside of the field, and how I can support the guys and push them and, and help them. So, 
but uh, on, on the other side is uh, I'm good. I feel great. I had a great off season. I had a a lot of time to to rehab my my quad and uh, feeling good. I came into the season with with high expectations for myself for the team, especially because we, uh, a couple of us were brought back and because of all the changes. So I'm motivated for us to do well. And like I said, uh, we we are really happy about the games that we're having up, but. The, the goal here is to start the season on the, on the right foot, and that's with, with three points at home. And, and we and we did see some attacking contributions. I didn't want to sneak this in. We did see some attacking, more attacking contributions from you there before the injury where you were starting to, to help deliver some assists and create things for others. Is that something you're looking to add more of to your game this year and looking to show more of in 2022? You know, you always want to improve. You're always looking to get better in, in areas, and there's always room for improvement. There is always something that you can be better at and you can keep working and. Absolutely. That's one area of my game that I want to develop even more and I want to help out. Uh, I think I do a great job defensively and and my ability to, to read the game, I think, is very high. But now I want to be able to progress my game and, and help out in the offensive side and maybe get a goal here or there. I haven't scored yet. I, I got one called back. So yeah, it's something that. that I'm definitely sure. Okay, well, Victor, before we let you go, and you are our first guest of the year, so this is you're going to be the very first one that we do this with. To end the interview, we want to do something a little more fun and lighthearted. We're gonna we're going to call it Tiki Taka, where we just ask you very simple questions, uh, and the first thing that pops into your head, you can just let us know. Um, should be nice and fun here, but I will start and I will ask you who is the and I know this is a brand new team, so you might not have a great uh, idea overall of the entire squad. So if you want to go and dive into maybe the last two iterations of Inter Miami, the last two seasons, you're more than free, feel free. You're more than welcome to. But who is the best dressed teammate you've had at Inter Miami? The best dressed teammate so far this year, I'd give that to Emerson. Emerson. OK, <laughs> well, all right. I didn't expect that one. Little dark horse. OK. Uh, yeah, he's been coming in dressed, looking nice, ready to go, impressed with his haircut, you know, all clean and very good. Very I, nice. I saw he's taking some selfies already in the, in the hotel bathroom he's staying at. So, yeah, <laughs> d- definitely, I definitely can see that. Definitely can see that. Uh, I think that your earliest, earliest football memory. My earliest football memory would be with my dad, just kicking the ball at the park. I got involved in it because of him. And, and I'm, I'm very, very grateful and thankful that he, he was able to introduce me to the sport. All right, I got next. Um, what would you do if, uh, if for some reason you ended up not becoming a football player? What, what, what do you think you'd be doing right now? What would I do? I used to, I used to want to be a lawyer. Uh, I, I talk a lot, and then I don't know if you guys have noticed that, but <laughs> younger, that's I, good. That's a good thing. I used to debate a lot with my my classmates, my teammates, and I always talked. And now that I speak both languages, I feel like that's what probably where I would have been. I don't know what kind of lawyer, but I might have been a lawyer. Victor, who is the funniest teammate that you've had at Inter Miami? The funniest guy from the past years or this year? I mean, if you if you have one that you can name off of this year, I mean, you feel know, this free. Year is, this year, somebody that's pretty been pretty fun to me has been Bryce. Bryce has come in and, you know, he's always joking. He's always laughing. He's always happy. And, and you get around him and uh, you have a good time. You have a good laugh for sure. Yeah, and just finally, uh, it's, it's, we're at Casa Ulawa. It's, it's a dinner party. You've got three dream guests to invite, dead or alive, doesn't matter. Who, who are they? Three dream guests. I would bring Zidane. He, he's my idol in, in soccer. I would bring LeBron James. I just think he's a beast and the GOAT. And then I would want to have Tom Brady at my house. You know, he's, he's the GOAT also. Wow, that's a real VIP need the red rope, I think, for the, uh, for the dinner table. Nice list, huh? I thought he was going to say us three. I thought he was inviting us over for dinner <laughs> tonight, but I guess we don't we don't make that cut, unfortunately. <laughs> Whatever you guys want. You guys are- I'll be taking the coach, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, Victor, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being our very first guest here on Miami Total Football Radio, as we also call it in Spanish, Miami Total Football Radio. We really appreciate your time. We look forward to the season, how you guys do. We will talk again very, very soon, but thank you again. And keep putting on that sunscreen because it's definitely a, a Victor Uyoa trademark at Inter Miami. Why why, did, why why, even put on so much? Because huh? it doesn't. you can tell that you have a lot on, a lot. Is it just you're trying to protect the skin, trying to keep nice and smooth? Yeah, just protecting the skin, man. I, I also wear in my Under Armour because of that. Yeah, yeah, I've noticed. I've noticed. You're definitely keeping keeping the, the tan at a nice glow. Okay, cool, Victor. Thank you again. We look forward to seeing you play on Wednesday, and we'll talk again very, very soon. All right, guys. Thanks. Thank See you. Thanks a lot, man.
Okay, guys, so that I thought was a pretty insightful, and I don't know about you guys, but I really enjoyed that interview with Victor Uyo, who, again, we appreciate him for coming on and speaking to us. What did you guys think about the interview? It's our first time. We have some kinks to work out on our side, but what did you think of just what he said in terms of, you know, the team himself and, and the whole thing? Yeah, I thought, he, I thought he was great. You know, normally when we're speaking to players, we have a very sort of limited time if it's a snap interview before the game or after the game. Or, you know, it's, you can never really get into, you know, what they're about and get a feel for the guys. It's very much biz- business. But we hope with these interviews, maybe we can just give you another side as well as talking about what's happening on the pitch. Just give you another side of their character, you know, what they like to do. Just just generally build a, a picture for the for the fans to understand what, you know, what these, these guys are about. They see them on the pitch. Uh, you know, every every week. But, you know, who are they? Who is Victor Alo? And I thought there were some nice tidbits. A lot, interesting that he was him that actually took it upon himself to to create the WhatsApp group. He's one of the experienced guys. It's interesting to know about the machinations of of, of squads and how they, they, you know, they come together. And also he, that he's a massive LeBron, that, that dinner party. Yeah, that was a good answer. <laughs> that was a good answer. That sh- shared some insight into, into Victor Alo. You know, he, he would have a table full of, of practically goats there. So that, that was a that was a good one. Good question there. Primo, Jose, what'd you think of the interview? Really quickly before we dive into the Q and A. No, I think I think it was great. I think it was great. You know, ever since the pandemic, we we have lost that opportunity to talk to the players in the locker room to get a little bit of more of a feel yeah. how they're doing, and you know, getting this type of interviews is not only allowing us to get back into that rhythm, but as well for the fans to just. Uh, know the, the the players a little bit better because now we talk to them only after the game and, and of course we have to ask them questions about the game and not about how they're feeling how they're doing uh, and what their thoughts are on the team so you know i really like the leadership that he showed on that interview you know talking about his teammates being concerned about how they're, how they're doing having a good communication so i think that's that's something that's really going to help the team and especially knowing his role right not every not every every game he's going to play He's going to be a starter or play full 90 minutes, but he's ready mentally and physically, it looks like it, to contribute to this team this year. So a great interview, and, and hopefully everybody's able to, to listen to it, and, and, and you know, and maybe we'll get some comments on it and, and what people think about maybe something that we missed asking that we'll be able to ask to some other players later on. But overall, I think, you know, it, it was very enjoyable. We enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I hope the listeners enjoyed it as well. I hope it brought something extra to the table and we're going to look to do that again throughout the course of the season with different protagonists at different moments we're also going to have some other interviews with maybe not people just necessarily on inter miami so stay tuned for that we want to make that a more regular part of this podcast going forward and again like Jose said if you have any tidbits or any remarks to help us improve it or anything else you think we should do feel free to leave us a comment be it on twitter or <coughs> via an Apple Podcast review. But let's jump into the Q&A session very quickly. Let's start here with Dos Nose, and he says, something we touched on earlier, we are still thin at the right-back position. What other, option, what other options are there if Yedlin does not come? I mean, I think Harvey Neville, he hasn't signed yet, but I think he's, he's, he's an option. Uh, you know, Christopher McVeigh, he was named in the press release as being able to play right back. So I think if, if they're not able to bring a right back, I think he could be the potential uh, stopgap solution until they, they bring somebody else in. So I, I think those might be two options. Not sure if there's anybody else in the foreign market or abroad that they're looking at, or maybe even within MLS that they're looking at. But you know, that's just the two names that come to mind from from within. Do you, either of you have any other names you want to add or anybody else you'd be like, hey, you know, maybe they should go and sign him. Uh, anyone at all. I think Yedlin would be would be an interesting um, move for sure, and if it sounds like it is actually going to going to happen, then I just yeah, I think you know offensively, I think he'll he'll give a lot, and um, it's just defensively. But if um, if anyone knows about fullbacks, it's Phil Neville, so that he could work on him maybe. I mean, he's, you know, he's twenty seven, twenty eight. He's not a kid, is he? So uh, you're kind of getting a, a finished product here. Um, but I'm in, I'm interested to see how he would mold into into that team. He's clearly the number one target, isn't he? Jose, anything you want to add there? No, I have no names to add, but I do agree that having Yedlin pretty much solves the problem. Yeah. Although you know you 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 would like to have a um, a good backup, um, and and again, listen, I think you know there, there's a, a good plan backup. That, a good backup behind him. 
Yeah, okay. yeah, behind him, just in case, you know, he's coming in. And, and remember, he's going to be, if he's called up to the national team, you know, he's, he's going to be away for, for some time. And so, you know, you want to be ready for that as well. So, um, but but I, I do trust Chris Henderson. Why am I trusting Chris Henderson so much this year? I, as, as I hear myself talking, <laughs> what I'm saying, I don't usually trust the general managers, but Listen, for some reason, Chris Anderson, I trust you. I trust you. Well, yeah, I do believe he has a plan for a right back. I like the job Chris Anderson has done this this offseason by and large. I do think there's some pieces missing. I think right back is one of them. If he can work his magic and get someone of DeAndre Yedlin on this team as part of a bigger, bigger transaction, because obviously they traded Christian McCoon to get that number one allocation spot. There's a lot of questions about why they would trade McCoon. I personally would take DeAndre Yedlin right now over Christian McCoon on my team. So if he if Chris Henderson's able to pull that off, I think that's a, a very good move for Inter Miami and it helps make him that much more competitive in 2022. Next question comes from Don Cafecito. He says, "Are you guys interested in having the new Messi burger at the Hard Rock, or is it just me? Is this a sign for Messi to Miami? Smiling emoji, and there's a picture of the ad of Leo Messi wearing a Hard Rock sweater hoodie." And it says new messy burger. There's a burger in front of him and it says Hard Rock Cafe. I actually saw this billboard earlier this week or over the weekend, excuse me, when I went to go visit a buddy from New York who was in town. He was staying in Brickell. So I went to go see him and I saw this giant messy burger ad on the side of a building. And I was like, oh, what's that? I've never seen that before. I do remember him when he came last year for vacation post Copa America. He went to the Hard Rock and took a photo with a picture and he posted it on his Instagram. And some people were like, oh, look, he's here in Miami. It's a sign that he's coming to the team, etc., etc." So I had not seen that ad, but am I, am I interested in having it? I mean, yeah, why not? I'll, I'll give it a try. I'm not a huge burger guy in general, but I'll, I'll give it a try. What about you guys? Well, since I'm the heavyweight of the group, I'll take this. <laughs> uh, listen, um, if anybody from the communication staff from hard rock is listening to this this is the number one podcast when it comes to inter miami one of the two professional teams in, in south florida it wouldn't be a bad idea to invite us to go and try the burger how about that i'll go i'll make the effort I'll <laughs> for you guys so um I'm, I'm here waiting right in front of my phone so that we can get the call you probably get the call franco so whenever you get it please let me know I have a I, – dude, like the picture, I don't know if you guys have seen it or if the listeners have seen it. If you haven't, look it up on Google. The burger is massive. It's massive. It's very, very tall, at least in the picture. You know, sometimes in the pictures they look one way, and then when you actually order it, it's, it doesn't look anywhere near as scrumptious. It just doesn't look as well put together. But, okay, I mean, yeah, we can, we can give it a try and, and, and share our thoughts if we end up having a, a messy burger. Steve, you're a vegan, so I don't think you're going to be having one, yeah? Yeah, no, it's not not for me. I've had the bun, um, unless there's a messy plant based uh, patty that I can uh, there you go or, or yeah. So uh, I can I could watch you maybe have a beer. Okay, yeah, I mean there's French fries too, so you could have some French fries. Pass, while we, um, I have some friends, you know, through, through that I've made throughout my life that actually work at the at the Hard Rock Hotel and Casino. So maybe I can you know pull some strings and get us get us a, a taste test of the messy messy burger. But next question, and it comes from Lucho Lalo, 1896. He says, "Oh man, Jose, I'm sorry. Before I get into the tweet, he he didn't he didn't give you a shout here, but it's okay. We'll make sure he does next time." He says, "Franco, Steve, Happy New Year. Are we getting Edlin? If not, who's going to be our right back? Also, where are the pink nets? And lastly, how and when do we get a third jersey? Even though we're getting the pink one, I feel like we should be a team that has black and pink and white or gray." Thanks. So we've touched on Edlin. We've t- oh, well the pink nets we've touched on with Lucho Lalo uh, throughout different episodes. I still think it's a great idea. Maybe we can get it this year. I don't know. I haven't heard anything with regards to that, but I do think it would be a good idea and just a nice little touch. I'll, I'll reiterate that. As for a third jersey, I think we could get one, if not this year, next year. I think we could see Inter Miami go with a third jersey uh, by next year, try to introduce something new, but we will, we will see. I mean, to be fair, Inter Miami has released a lot of uh, alternate jerseys as part of MLS campaigns, be it training tops or the blue one that they released last year for for one game that was part of the you know 
I'm trying to remember what it was, but recycling plastic from the ocean. So they've had different jerseys. Steve, I know you love this topic of jerseys. So when do you think Inter <laughs> Miami can get a third jersey? When do I think it's going to happen? Yeah, just you know, throw throw a date throw a date out there next year. I don't know. I mean, how about that? What color should it be? A good question. Uh, what about some sort of nod? I mean, that the heat the heat move around, don't they? Sometimes they play in white. Sometimes they play in like a darker color. It's maybe like dolphin green. Maybe that with that is that a little nod <laughs> to the dolphins. Could that work? Okay. All right. Interesting. I don't know if I agree, but interesting. Jose, what about you? What color should it be? How about that? Let's let's answer the question. About how, what color should it be? Because they're getting a pink one this this year, which is from everything I've heard, all signs are pointing to early to mid February for the unveiling. So if you're eagerly looking to see what it looks like, that's around when it might be shown. They'll have that as the home jersey or the primary jersey. The black one with the pink from last year will be the secondary jersey. So they will no longer have a white kit. So what color, if they got a third jersey, should they go with Jose? How about a mix of all three colors? You know, it's all plain, plain, either um, black, white, or pink. So mix them up. See what comes up. I I will suggest that. And I think it'll be something different. Of course, you know, the third kit now, you know, it's more... um, it's more about selling jerseys, bringing something new, something different. It isn't necessarily to, you know, differentiate from your opponent. So I would say that. Go with three, all three colors and see. Be creative. Okay. Okay. That's That sounds interesting. I, what color would I like to see? Hmm. That's a good – it's a good question. Because if they're going to have pink, if they're going to have black – You know, maybe you bring a a different white, a different white with uh, some different elements. Maybe, maybe, or a gray, a gray, if they they do have gray in the stadium. Um, It's a good question. I actually don't know what the answer is there. And I I do like talking jersey. So maybe I'll put some thought into that and come back next week with, uh, with some with some better ideas there. But let's leave it there for the Q&A session for this week, and we will give our final thoughts. I will start, then Steve, then Jose, and I will start by sharing details of this past weekend's Friendly, which is has not been put out there yet, so this is brand new news. Inter Miami played, and I will stress this point, played an unorthodox style Friendly against the Columbus crew behind closed doors. So media could not attend, fans could not attend, but sources have told me that Inter Miami played a four-period game against the crew. Each period consisted of 20 minutes. So they, in total, played 80 minutes. I heard two different lineups were used in 40-minute intervals. So there was one team that played in the first 40 minutes, and there was a completely different team that played in the second 40 minutes. Fort Lauderdale CF players were used. They were sprinkled in into both teams. Now, combined aggregate score... Inter Miami was outscored four to one, four to one. The lone goal came from Ian Frey off of a corner kick, and it wasn't a header. He kicked it in with his with his right foot, and he scored that in the first forty minute interval. So Inter Miami in that interval was outscored two to one. In the second forty minute interval, they were outscored two to zero. So that's my final thought, sharing the details of the first friendly. We now it's not a mystery anymore. It was it ended four to one. Ian Frey with the lone. Heron goal. It just it's, it's good that the, the the preseason now is coming to the point where we're, we're going to start seeing games. You know, we can talk if, if, as much as we want about new players and everything, but we've not really seen the team play. So I'm uh, interested to see exactly how they're going to line up. And um, yeah, it's a good opportunity to get down to the to the stadium and um, see some more faces, see some new faces, old faces, and, um, and get get back into it. It's, it's like the season's never really finished, but I guess. Um, you know, with the World Cup uh, later on this year, um, everything's crunched up. And um, yeah, football really is now 365, which does not stop, which is good. <laughs> Jose, you're up. Well, yeah, my final thought is, you know, it, it, sometimes when you go to training, you know, each and every one of us look at different things, right? And um, the one thing that caught my attention the last time I was there was um, Noah Allen, you know, young player. I think he was named... Um, young player of the year in USL League One last year. Yeah, you no, know, and it really caught my attention. And I tweeted about this before he got called up to the under twenty national team. But it, it really caught my attention. The technical ability, you know, he's not big or strong, but he's quick enough, good with the ball. 
And and I really like the communication with his teammates. I, I think I saw some good combinations there. You know, he's a player that looks um, really, really close to, to playing at the MLS level. So mm-hmm. he's very young, though, very young. But again, you know, it's when you're 18, 19 years old right now, it's not like it used to be. You know, us players at that age are now ready to play at the MLS level. And so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets an opportunity later on this year. I believe he's 17. And I agree with you. And I, Jose, we tend to have similar viewpoints quite often, more so than, than Steve and I. But I do agree with you that I, the, from what we saw of him in training, I thought he looked like he belonged. Like he did not look like he was 17 and like outmatched physically or at least from the bits we saw. And he has been called up to the under 20 U.S. men's national team. So his his star continues to grow at a at a at a decent rate here. He still doesn't have an Inter Miami contract as of right now. Right now, he's still a Fort Lauderdale CF player, but obviously one to keep an eye on going forward but anyway that does it for this week's pod thank you guys again of course for listening thank you to victor uyoa for being our first guest and and going through the tiki taka with us as well and again we thought it was an excellent interview but again if you guys have any remarks or comments or anything you guys can share with us on how to make it better how to make these interviews better going forward please please do so as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, formerly known as iTunes. We have some games to watch this week, so when we return next week, we will dive into what we've seen, some tactical analysis, and obviously bring you all the latest news, opinions, and updates. For Steve Brenner, for Jose Armando, I am Franco Penizo. This is Miami Total Football Radio. We'll talk to you guys again very soon.